Welcome back. Um, this is lecture two of week two. I uh, wanted to, uh, we're discussing startups and wanted to go a little bit more in depth and take a look a little bit more as far as the, uh, the pros and cons and some of the, the failure rates and things that startups and, and beginning companies do uh, that can actually hinder um, any growth and opportunity and potentially put them uh, out of business, so to speak. So, um, last so class, we last lecture we talked a lot about what's uh, the right thing to do, how to lead through it, the leadership styles and things of that nature that go through it, and all like the you know the, the right things to do and some examples of you know the positivities that could come from it. Now we're going to kind of go over some of the the fails and the things that are missed out, so you can have a kind of uh, both sides of the spectrum, so to speak. So why startups fail? We're going to do a quick look of uh, the top twenty reasons, and I'm going to go through these pretty quickly because. 20 reasons is a lot of them, but as far as I'm going to still like um, harp on each individual one and give it its own time to do. So, why do startups fail, right? Uh, first one um, is no market need, meaning that startups succeed by solving a problem through engineering. So, as we talked about like product development, typically it's always a an issue or a problem that comes up and that's the company that comes up with a service or a product line to solve a said problem or to cater to a certain need. A lot of times startups fail because the idea is there, but there's no actual market, true market need for whatever was came up with as far as a product or a service. It's not really rendering a huge amount of uh, crowding and, and people that want it. Um, one of the other possi possibilities and things that happen a lot is running out of cash. Um, this can be a form of underfunding or mismanagement of funds. This could be not proper costing. This could be uh, just going over budget and, and not having any type of discretionary funding that could take over um, if a product or service beside, becomes over um, saturated with you know, problems and issues that have to be paid for. Um, a lot of times that can happen and also mismanagement of funds mean that money was put where it shouldn't have been and a lot more frivolous spending happened and it pretty much just uh, costed the company right out of business. Uh, a lot of times it happens too is that there's not the right team, there's a lack of leadership, motivation can hurt a small company, um, things of that nature, just a really, really uh, poor job of actually assembling the right people and resources together in order to make something happen. Um, also, one that happens a lot for certain industries, competition kills them. Uh, they're not properly prepared for a competitive market innovation. A much larger competitor just kind of swoops in and either just crushes them, pushes them out, drops their prices so low to push them out, kind of like the Walmart model of, of organizations, because um, Walmart's gotten in trouble for many times for doing that, going into rural areas and uh, going extremely low with their prices to drive out all the competition, all the mom and pop places, all the small businesses. Um, so you pretty much only have a Walmart as your option to pretty much buy anything that you have to. <laughs> Excuse me. So competition could kill them and come down to that as well. Um, they can litigate them to death and things of that nature. Another one, um, pricing or cost issues. Too costly of a product for market can kill sales. Can kill sales meaning that you price yourself out of your own markets. And so you have to kind of pick and figure out exactly the, the marketing and the pricing structure that's going to make sense for your organization that will maximize the most amount of profit but makes the sense of exactly what the industry standard or the market standard what consumers are um, willing to pay and actually go for. I mean a lot of times you can go and, and you can attack a very high-end version if you look at kind of like the, the variety of vehicles that you can purchase right you have like lower end vehicles that still are pretty expensive <laughs> and then you have like super high end like Lamborghinis, Bugattis, things of that nature that are millions of dollars. Now um, is it cost effective to make you know millions of these million dollar cars? No, because not that many people are going to buy them. But as far as uh, making the right supply and having the right demand for it, you can push it out there. But if you're making, that's because you're making super high end cars and you have a you know, very specific clientele. Um, on the flip side, if let's say if you made just something that's you made a you know a Hyundai Accent and you charge you wanted to charge two hundred thousand dollars for it, um, or you made a competitor that looks like that, <laughs> people are going to go for it because there's no value in that. There's no way of actually really deeming that worth um, the cost associated with it, and so um, you'll kill your own market that way by pricing yourself right out of your own consumer because. Um, whenever your consumer is, as far as their uh, buying power and what they're willing to pay and will okay to pay for certain products and services, that's what you have to kind of cater to. Um, another one that happens is poor product. It's just a lack of testing preparedness for product launch. Just something was pushed out that was trash. I mean, it, 
it's, it's, it happens. It breaks a lot. It's not built up to snuff. It was just a poor product build. It goes from there. Um, another one is like having no business model. A great idea is not, I always say a great idea is never good enough. You have to have some kind of business model, longevity, strategic plan, vision, a mission, and all those things to go with any type of longevity and also any type of uh, you know, growth opportunities that go with it. Um, a big one is poor marketing. If no one can find your product, then no one's going to buy it, right? Um, this is either poor marketing or just lack of marketing to, to actually draw people into your establishment, your go see your products and services, and actually know what your company is. The biggest disconnect and the biggest thing that marketing agencies and marketing departments are supposed to do is pretty much say, uh, we know that there is a certain demographic or a customer base that's looking for our products and service. We need to find that median to match these two people up so we can both be successful. Meaning the consumer um, gets whatever product or service that they want and the company is able to provide that and make a profit doing so. Otherwise. Um, that there's a disconnect between the two, between the cons between the, the the consumers that actually want and need these products and services, and the companies that can provide. And if you can't find that link, if they can't find you, if they can't simply you know have a really easy mode of, of getting uh, information from your organization and price checking and or doing whatever it needs to that bring value in it, then no one's going to buy it. Another one is uh, ignoring customers. It's just focusing not focusing on customer feedback and needs, just kind of assuming that you know what's right, that's going to usually end up failing that way. Um, one other one that I always like to discuss is product is possibly missed time, just either launch too early or too late. Now, I bring this up because I always like talking about like virtual reality in this type of circumstance, right? So virtual reality, AR, art, and reality, these are becoming things that are very popular, very hot, and, and a lot of people are transitioning to um, VR platforms for games, for entertainment, for work purposes. It's a really cool engine and platform to utilize and it's actually getting much easier to build in these in, in a, in a um, software-based VR realm um, using certain game engines and certain engines in general to create assets and to create a virtual reality. Now, that's cool, right? But on the flip side, I always joke and talk about that I remember VR, in my opinion, has never been something new because I remember being told about virtual reality when I was young, probably in like the early 90s and late 80s. And all they pretty much did with this kind of VR was that they would they didn't have it very good for for um, <laughs> any type of entertainment purposes. But the gaming industry was trying to you know get involved with VR, and they created like Nintendo Red. And a couple other systems that could that were deemed VR, and it pretty much was jamming a 2D rendering video, side scroller video game into your face, and like you could pan your head side to side, and you could see the entire game board that way. Um, granted, that's cool and all, but the the money that it took to actually make that functional and operational was pretty extravagant. People couldn't bring those into their homes, it was quite expensive, and there was very limited with as far as the availability of what it would be able to play under or be able to use it for, and so that kind of just you know, killed it, and I always show, tell you that that's virtual reality being mistimed for the launch, and it was way too early. Same thing with electric cars, same thing with the early adoption of Tesla. Um, Tesla was a huge failure for a very long time until Elon Musk came about, bought, the comp like, bought into the company and started pushing them out and actually getting uh, more productivity. And now they're, they were doing really well. Now they're in kind of a flux trying to figure out this whole rocket situation, but that's a different discussion there. Another one is losing focus. Um, the vision changed, the, I guess the business needs go a different way. So changing visions and ideas, founders get like self-absorbed and they lose focus on exactly what's gonna be happening. And so when this happens, you know, uh, it becomes a chaotic work environment. A lot of people are going in different directions and no one's kind of working together to accomplish a common goal. This lack of focus can, uh, you know, deharmonize organization and actually push away customer bases. Uh, another one is um, disharmony with investors. So investors, uh, angel investors, venture capitalists, they're an important part of the, your organization because they're the financing backing everything that works and goes on, right? So um, if you have a disharmony with investors as far as you're like ignoring them, uh, their demands or focusing, uh, or, for, or even on the flip side, focusing too much on their needs and their wants, a lot of times you can put the company right under. Because if you ignore your investors too much, what do you think is going to happen? 
know, you know, I've already can just adjust to what you're going to say. They're going to start pulling out their money or trying to invest and go somewhere else, right? They're going to start looking at you and your organization as not a solid investment. They're going to try to go other ways. Another one is if you focus too much on them, which we've seen so many organizations that just focus on the bottom line or just trying to get the biggest rate of return on their stock prices and things of that nature. And in, in the short sight, it might help the organization, but in the long term, it starts hurting uh, customer satisfaction. It starts putting them in a skeleton crew so that their operations go down. It starts uh, raising costing. It starts going up because of other things that they start pulling from or changing in order to make their bottom line look a little bit better for that single quarter to make their investors happy. So there's that kind of uh, plethora that goes into it. So you want to make sure you have a harmony with your investors, not a disharmony. Um, change gone bad is not, like I said, change is inevitable, so you have to be prepared for it, but bad change can really, really hurt an organization <laughs> and potentially even like put it out of business depending on how either, um, you know, how new the organization is or how stable and solidified the company is. Many startups and, and, and new entrepreneurs are around a very, very kind of like fixed income setup in a very, very thin line as far as what they can do before they get pushed out of business, right? So uh, making sure that the, the change that you have doesn't go bad, but that, it, you know, and make, you don't want to make too much changes or too big of changes to the organization too fast because that can also be detrimental with pushback. Another one is lack of passion. Um, I always say that any every any and every successful entrepreneur or person that gets involved with a startup from the ground up, they have to be uh, have a passion for that organization, that product and service, that company. Something's got to motivate them on an emotional level for them to get interactive and, and do a good job with it. Otherwise, if they do just become cogs that are just punching in and out and collecting a paycheck, it's going to reflect on the workload and the work and also how the customer interactions work that way. And so... And then also, um, you have to focus on the passion of the work. If you get too focused on like profits or uh, you know the bottom line and just looking to cut costs and do whatever you can to cut corners in order to make your company appear better on a balance sheet and you focus on the wrong things, um, you lose that passion of like trying to actually be engaged with your customer base and, and employees and you start just looking at it as a money stream and that's going to be an issue. Um, another one that's kind of more like retail or more of like a uh, you know brick and mortar setup is just simply bad location. You know it was a poor decision on where the business was actually going to be. Like we go, we decided to move into a, a complex with a bunch that's starting to die, and a bunch of businesses around me are going out of business, which doesn't look good for me. And it's also drawing less traffic into our specific area that we're in. It could be in a, a rough area. It could have a bad zip code. It could. There's a bunch of things that could go with it. It could just be poorly located. I mean, it's in like a, uh, a warehousing sector, and it's so hard to find that people, unless people are specifically Googling your organization or, or doing uh, maps specifically to find your company, no one's going to kind of just foot traffic it or nobody's going to just drive by it and be curious. Um, so that goes from there. Another one is like no uh, financing or investor interest, meaning that your company is so un- I guess attractive to investors that if you can't get the money to actually back what you're trying to do. Now, when this happens, you have a, a tough question to ask yourself. You, one, you have to say, okay, so no investors are giving me any type of funding for this. There's no interest in my organization. So, what am I doing wrong that's not uh, working with that? And so, you as the excuse me, as the business owner, person that's trying to generate this, you have to take a hard look and figure out exactly what is making your organization so unattractive to investors and financing, especially if that's going to be something that you're trying to go down the line to achieve. Is it the um, overall profitability and revenue streams? Is it the balance sheet? You have too many, uh, you know, too many assets. Is the company not generating enough cash flow over like a certain duration of time? You have to figure out what it's going so you actually can, you know, make adjustments to it and figure out the best practices to remedy these situations. Another one is legal issues. Um, you got sued. <laughs> You're getting sued. Uh, you uh, interrupted a federal regulation or a state regulation, and you have to deal with that, or you have to close based on it. Um, your restaurant serving very dirty food, and a health inspector comes in. <laughs> and you down. Terrible example. Don't ever do that. Um, but again, legal issues can be a unexpected battle that could force a company out of business, depending on what happens. A 
a consumer is suing the organization, another company is suing you based on some kind of infringement or something of that nature. There's a whole bunch of things that can go wrong with that certain circumstance. Um, another one is another one is not using their your own network as far as um, you personally as a owner, operator, founder, but also the founders, the board of directors, or whoever else you have attached and has a pretty high stake in the organization's success. Um, you know, use these individuals, use all their connections, use your own uh, to establish stronger relationships with your community and also business leaders and people that you find trustworthy and that can aid you in your success and you can help them with their success. Uh, but a lot of times founders, uh, don't use their own connections and they try to do everything alone and it ends up being a failure and I always like to quote um, Arnold Schwarzenegger when he always this does the speeches on there's no such thing as self-made that everyone gets help and he always states that he would be where he was if he didn't have help from the close friends and family and, and people that kind of guided him over the years so always remember that make sure you use your network it's not a pride thing it's a look you need to be you have to be successful by doing this, otherwise it's never going to have a, a, the transcending success that you're looking for. Another one is burnout. Um, a lot of entrepreneurs and, and business leaders just end up putting way too many hours, spending way too much time, and just putting too much effort into their organizations, which which I get it. I mean, if you build something from scratch, you're going to want to have a stake in it. This is your baby, so to speak, and you don't want anything to happen to it. You don't want anything, and if something bad does happen, you want to be there to fix it or you want to be the cause of it, not let uh, somebody else do it. But um, with that constant barrage of being in, involved with your organization comes burnout. And leaders become like too strained or lack of work-life balance. And without that kind of happy balance and medium, um, you can go you know, you can go off the deck pretty easily <laughs> and start having a lot of anxiety and breakdowns and just um, anger outlets and things of that nature that come up. And then 20 is just, the uh, last one is failure to change. This is not making changes when needed, being very stick in the mud. Um, I always love using a, an example, which I think I might have talked about in past classes, called uh, with, uh, with Kodak, because I'm from upstate New York, um, from Rochester, and that's where Kodak was founded. Kodak was one of the largest um, film and camera companies in the world at one point in time. And um, because they had lack of changes into the digital age, they ended up you know, not changing themselves into a very obsolete old school mentality of a company and a product line and eventually just going down to almost nothing and filing for bankruptcy and being a shadow of what they are in the end. So these are just a kind of like high level version of like some of the things that could fail as far as an organization uh, from the beginning as far as like why startups fail. These are typically correlated with many different companies, um, and a lot of times you might have worked in this type of situation and watched your company go um, belly up from that uh, type of setup as well. Now, um, I want to kind of change gears because we talked about like failures and what can happen, uh, but I also want to discuss, now I want to kind of get more situational and kind of build in some scenarios. So I know granted this is a recording. But what I'd like to do is we're going to walk through a couple situations and scenarios. I want you to give it some thought. Um, I know we can't have a dialogue because, uh, sadly, I'm not you know, physically there. But I want you to you know, kind of think about it and kind of start laying out the groundwork of how you handled each situation as we kind of moved into it. All right? So let's kind of revisit what startup leadership looks like, right? We talked about the intro to startups as far as, like, the setup, the organizational structure, the financial obligation, the mission and vision, preparing for any type of expansion or growth. And then in the past uh, you know, weeks, we've talked about good habits as far as like daily huddles, watching for talent, keeping superiors informed, self-sacrifice, comfortable with instability and change, honesty and accountability. Like these are the good habits of a solid leader. And then we're going to kind of correlate these into um, the various things that happen when it comes to you know, startup situations. So... And then I also have to discuss this and bring it up, and I, I'm not sure if I have yet, but I want to discuss it now, is there's there's pretty much like three different situations that you're going to get into as a leader. There's the ones with just individuals. You, you as their leader or boss or whatever your title is, and you're supported. Like and there, there's an individual leadership situation of one person at a time. There's a group one, meaning that 
you have your team, you have two or three of them, you have four or five of them. There's like, it's a grouping of leadership situations that come up, right? And then there's organization, which is the entire company as a whole. And that, was, that is a leadership situation that could come up. So I always, to kind of like recap and kind of like really, really hone in on exactly what I'm talking about, in certain leadership situations that you get into, whether they're positive or negative, they're typically always going to fall under these three categories, which it's just dealing with one person, dealing with a group of people, or dealing with the whole company. And that's pretty much it in a nutshell as far as the situations, all right? So let's go ahead and start to apply our leadership abilities that we are going to be kind of going more in depth with um, as we progress. There's earning trust and respect, conflict management, communication, motivating and inspiring, encouraging career growth, and then leading through change, right? These are some of the key things that we're going to talk about as far as that is concerned. And then um, to kind of just you know glance over all these and discuss it, earning trust and respect is how you actually go in, give respect, and, and build that relationship with your with your subordinates. Conflict management is your situational ability to handle any type of conflict that comes up, whether it's something pretty ridiculous and childish like uh, two employees arguing over football teams based on, on Sunday's performance, which you may, may or may not be happy about. Um, I personally am not, but that's a different discussion. But it also is how you are going to handle the, the various conflicts that happen in your organization, miscommunication, two people can't work together, uh, things like that. You want to make sure you have a preemptive plan in place in order to handle that. Communication lines, we've all talked about communication in our submission, so I don't really need to harp on it, but <clears throat> it's communication is a skill set, like not just a lack of it, but proper communication, good, effective delegation, good, effective direction given, because um, a lot of times your word is, is law and your word is the only thing that these employees and subordinates are going to be listening to, so make sure that you articulate, you're very specific, and they understand exactly what the output is supposed to be so they can give that to you. Uh, there's motivation inspiring, just kind of, you know, rallying the crowd and getting each individual ready to go and amped for working that day and performing for you. A great environment to set up because that energy is, is infectious and it could go really, really well. And, and also, on the flip side, pessimistic attitudes and negativity can also fester quite easily and turn a very positive work environment into a very negative one quite easily. So always keep in mind about that. Uh, another one's encouraging career growth because I always talk about like watching for talent and trying to like captivate the employees that you have now. Like I said, you might hire somebody for a completely different task, but they have skill sets and abilities in another that's more pertinent to the company's overall spectrum and goal, and you can transition them and you can get them ready and up to speed to do so. Uh, last one is leading through change. Now, like I said, the one thing that I can guarantee you, no matter where you're working, what you're doing, startups, entrepreneurs for your own stuff, working for enterprise level, just having a job in general, change is inevitable, whether it's in your personal life or, or profession. And so you need to be prepared for it and you need to be able to lead through that change with change leaders, with reaffirmations, with uh, constant feedback, a good loop, a good dialogue as far as making sure you talk to them live through email. Um, it's, it's a messenger, whatever systems that you have in order for you to really get uh, that across as far as exactly what you need to do. All right? So anyway, that's a high level. Let's go over some situations and kind of think it through, right? And like I said, we're not going to be able to do this live because I'm recording this and this is something that I want you to kind of think of and, and play through because um, as we progress, I'm going to be constantly throwing come up some kind of examples at you of what you would do in certain situations. So this one is... Um, specifically, you, you just landed a job as a senior director for a small company. Um, it's, it's only been in business for about a year, so it's not that longevity of an organization. The company is under 50 employees, and 32 of them are frontline workers, meaning the majority of the company are people that work directly with the clients and the customers. Um, you are brought in, and you are now splitting responsibility with only one other director to oversee the, to now oversee about 16 employees, all right? Um, that have been there since the creation of companies. So you're new. They're, they've been there since the beginning. Um, you're starting to get split up the workload uh, between a few different directors as opposed to just the one. And so you're getting a plethora of new employees to manage, to watch over, and to do. So um, 
the caveat to this is, like I said, these employees have been there since the organization started and it's been around for a little over a year. You're brand new, so you may or may not have assimilated nor earned the trust and respect of your peers so and your team. So how would you earn this team's trust and respect? So I want you to give that a good thought and some good practices on what you would think you would do with that type of situation. Um, so think, think, think. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to tell you just some of my own personal experiences and what I potentially would do in this situation as well. And then you can correlate, overlap, and then, uh, think about it that way. So, um, so I've had to do this in the past with uh, certain jobs that I've taken as far as project management or consulting work where I don't have as much expertise understanding or abilities as, as a lot of the subordinates that I'm overseeing, right? Um, as a project manager, a lot of times you don't have the skill sets, but you have to you know, relay that and be honest about it and also lean really heavily on your um, your counterparts that do as far as that information so you can make sure that you are being optimal and taking care of what the company's needs are. So anyway, um, back to the scenario at hand, how would you earn the team's trust and respect? Um, the first thing you have to do is come in with an honest depiction and a really good vision and mission of exactly what needs to happen so they know that you're genuine right then and there. I um, also would recommend that um, you don't braid them, you don't focus on micromanaging or anything of that nature. You're a new manager trying to set a tone, an example of self-reliance, self-work. You're, you're an adult, I trust you to do your job and take care of it. And you have to withhold that situation. So you can't six months from start you get a little squeeze or a little like pushback from senior management that you're not doing enough and all of a sudden you start getting your employees in headlocks and things of that nature so you don't want to do that so earn their trust and respect by being communicative and transparent being honest if you're you know um not in, you know versatile in certain aspects of the job title be very upfront with your limitations and what you're willing and can do for them and just kind of go from there and that's going to earn their respect over time by you just keeping your word and doing as much as you can to make their lives easier um, again don't you can't rush the situation you can't make it happen faster um, and also just because somebody works for you or is your subordinate does not mean that you own them and so you have to treat them with some kind of dignity and respect all right so moving on to conflict management which is one of my favorite KB, uh, things to talk about so conflict management happens, right? Like I discussed. Now here's a scenario that I'm going to put you guys in just to think about for a bit. You've been hired on a small startup company that just started about three months ago. So it's a brand new company. The entire, the entire company is only 20 people. And so um, it's a very, very small company. 20 people is it. And now you become second in command of this company because there's not that many positions and you were hired on specifically for a task. You have no HR department or supports, but you've been tasked with setting up a company's employee dispute process. Um, luckily, you've taken this class, you're well educated, and you understand what conflict, conflict management is, right? So, what type of process would you set up for this? Now, we um, so give us some thought, but I, ha I haven't really like formalized a conflict management scenario with you guys just yet. But we're going to discuss that. What um, so? A conflict management scenario is like a preemptive strike on any type of situation that comes up within the workplace and how to push through that, how to manage it, and how to mitigate it as fast as humanly possible, right? Conflict is bad in the workplace. It can create a toxic environment. You want to you know, get rid of it quickly, diffuse it. Um, you do not want to push it under the rug or just dis, you know, dishearten it, but you want to you know, face it front, uh, make sure everyone comes to a common ground and move through it. But anyway... So what type of process would you create for your dispute process? Now, um, I've worked for a few past companies. Now, the, the most one I, one I always like to put on um, display or discuss is when I was working for a um, smaller startup called uh, Hot Shop, which you might see here in your, your examples as you pull through, because I like to use real, real company examples um, and scenarios. But anyway, um, we had a very strict process of exactly how we would handle disputes, because we were a sales-based organization. Uh, so, you know, with a sales type organization where people have uh, limitations or regions or sections or certain customer base, there's going to, the hostility and conflict is going to happen. There's going to be lead disputes. There's going to be like, hey, you poached my clients. Hey, you're in my territory type situation. It's going to happen, right? Uh, so what you have to do is come up with the scenario for it. So the best practices that I can recommend to you and the things that I've seen in the past and done is that Typically, you want to diffuse it really quickly so 
as a leader, you have your own methodology of working in for emotional intelligence and diffusing it as much as possible. But the conflict has to be resolved, meaning that you have to go through a process in order to do that. So the dispute process that for a company, and I guess a long story short, and as I'm getting a little long-winded with this, but to be frank, what we were doing is if two people had a conflict, we would tell them, we push them in a room, a conference room, and tell them, figure it out. Come to a mutual agreement of whatever is best in the interest of whatever you're arguing about, whether it's a customer, a lead dispute, a situation at work, who's, who said what, who's supposed to do what. You two figure it out. If you can't figure it out, we're going to put a your manager or another manager in there to help you to, me, to mediate this situation. If they can't work it out, then we're going to send we're going to send in a, a human resources. We're going to send you down to human resources, and you're going to deal with it conflict that way. And then they're going to make a judgment call on exactly what's going to happen in the end of this process. So. We had this three-tier process, but we typically were using it to kind of diffuse situations faster because nobody, it's, it's funny because even though HR is not supposed to be this, nobody likes to actively go to HR, especially for a lead dispute or, or like a, a conflict situation. Um, you know, you don't mind going there to talk benefits or to like <laughs> check your amount of sick time or vacation time you have or how that policy works. but. Nobody likes to go down there for conflict and disciplinary reasons. It's usually a very bad thing, which it's not supposed to be, but that's how this turned into over the past you know, 30, 40 years. Anyway, um, so that would be a deterrent, but typically we'd push them in a room and they would figure it out. Worst case scenario, we'd send in a manager and then they'd mediate it and come out, um, you know, either completely both happy with the, the resolution that they came with and being able to vent and talk about their own uh, issues or hang-ups or what they believed happened and then you know moving on from, and moving on from that but there also could be you know one person feels like they got kind of screwed in the deal anyway but you want to make sure that you have a very strict process of like okay you guys are arguing these are the steps you're going to take if there's this kind of situation these are the steps you're going to take you want people to be systematic and knowing and being prepared for what's going to happen when it comes to conflict and conflict resolution. Uh, communication, which we've talked about a bunch, and a, a lot of your submissions include proper communication channels and pro being a proper communicator, um, not just being recluse or hiding behind your computer or your desk or hiding in your office. So the communication situation I'm going to put in front of you is that you're a senior manager role for a small tech company. It's kind of seen the theme, they're all small companies. Anyway, the, the CEO slash owner is a standard introvert that only talks to their leadership staff about company vision, uh, changes growth and progress. So this person only talks to you and your executive staff that's on the small little panel about anything about the organization for you know the vision, for growth, for any type of changes in progress. And he or she does not like to communicate um, to the company as a whole. Which is a problem when you don't have it, when you have a very uncharismatic CEO that can resonate as bad things. But anyway, the CEO never does company meetings or town halls to inform their employees of anything, right? And the company has about 50 people that all work in the same office, so it's not hard to actually facilitate and do this. But um, only you have, uh, only you and five others have been given information that affects everyone in the company. So like I said, the CEO does not do a good job of disseminating information amongst the entire company. He or she brings in his, he or, she, his or, he or she's very key executive staff, which you're on, and gives you very specific roles as far as job responsibilities to get done. You do the best that you can to make sure it happens. Now, um, you know, back to the communication. What communication process would you use to set up a dissemination of information? So this current situation is talking about that there's a disconnect between the CEO and information going to the front line and the rest of the employees of the organization. He or she's talking to very key individuals at the top, but that information is not being pushed to the rest of the organization. It's becoming bottlenecked, where, um, which allows rumors to be spread, allows people to panic and, and think that ill things which is funny to me because anytime something gets rocky, almost every person at the company is going to think they're, they're getting laid off or the company's going to fold or it's going to get bought by a larger company and we're all going to have a job, but there's a whole bunch of things that go with it. But anyway, um, so, so give us some thought of how you would you know 
fixate this communication process. And I can tell you from personal experience dealing with this type of situation, um, but my situation was not, uh, my, my CEO and owner was not an introvert. They just were never really there. They were constantly traveling. They were constantly abroad. Um, they were not really standard. So they would just disseminate information for the executive staff, leave, and hope that everything got transitioned the way it needed to, which is also not the most optimal, but at least it's not being introverted and afraid to talk to people. But anyway, um, back to the communication plan. So uh, some of the key successes or things to do in that in that circumstance is like if you're in a situation where the your CEO or your, your leader is giving you information that they want you to disseminate in a certain manner to your uh, team members, you start to facilitate how that's going to happen. And so the communication plan needs to be I always say it needs to be very, very transparent and quick. So um, if the CEO or the executive staff gives you information about a change, about a company, about a product, a service, or anything with that organization, that you're immediately taking that information and either compiling an email to go to your entire team or taking them all off the floor really quickly and discussing it with them. But you're going to be very quick to explain exactly what they're going to be getting, getting themselves into and what's going to be happening with their current situation. And so that's a portion of the communication plan. So when you're doing, oh, sorry, jump back. When you're doing the communication plan, um, you want to make sure that you have a process, whether it's, uh, you know, meetings, town halls, etc. however it needs to go for that situation, right? Motivation and inspiration. Uh, yay this, right? The scenario I'm putting you in is that a small company you work for has assigned you a project to manage. Ten employees have been pulled off their normal work to aid in this venture of securing a new division of the organization. Uh, some have volunteered, but most were just kind of like tapped on the shoulder one day and just dragged away <laughs> to do something else uh, and to do this for the company. So only 30 people in the entire organization as well, and 10 of them are getting pulled off for this specific task. The project is supposed to take about six to eight months to complete, and most of your team does not seem happy about the circumstance. So what are you going to plan on doing to motivate your team? So um, put your thinking caps on, put yourself in a scenario. You know, you've been dubbed this project manager of a certain department that's, that's temporary in the organization. The company has tapped 10 of their employees on the shoulder to come help with this venture that they don't seem too happy about. Um, what would you plan to motivate your team? Now, I always say like when you're in a project management setup like this, where it's a certain, there's a start, middle, and end to a specific project, and you have a certain allocated resources, team members, and timing to actually get this done. Um, incentivizing with money and time are always really great to do because that's you know people love those things. Like asking, um, if as long as you can get clearance for it, you know, promising getting them more additional vacation days or time off from work based on their performance or finishing a deadline in a certain project or just giving them monetary as far as some kind of money bonus or additional hours, something of that nature to help it make make it worth their while to be pulled off this project and just help the company. Because uh, you can't expect your employees to just automatically care about the organization as much as the highest level executives, the CEOs, or the owners, because they don't. I mean, they care about their jobs and maybe they want to be successful and help the company be successful, but um, push comes to shove, it's not their company, it's not their organization. And, you know, if it goes belly up, they just go somewhere else. And if it does super, super successful, they may or may not share in that that wealth and that uh, prosperity, which most likely, to most of the time they won't. So uh, that goes with it. But so, motivation. I would say time and money start whenever you can incentivize to work off that. Also, you have you can lean on your charismatic abilities if you have them, discussing uh, all the things that they need to. You know, this is great for career opportunities, great for career growth. Um, it showcases your leadership skills. And we really are looking at you being able to complete projects in a timely manner and actually being effective with it. Um, you know, you pro going on the career path as far as like career growth and path, and that could be a possible way of, of motivating. Another one's just being charismatic, saying, like, this is cool, you got chosen, you know, kind of putting them on a pedestal and building up their ego to think that, hey, I'm, you know, better than my support, my counterparts, so I should need to show off because they, you know, handpicked me to do this specific project. So you have to figure out exactly what the motivation is for each individual on that team that you're working with and cater to it. If you can offer certain things, by all means, do so because you should want to do those things. 
But if you're unable to, if you're not getting the green light for it, you're going to have to find ways of getting them in the mood to work and to get this output out that you need to. And so you have to get creative. You have to you have to do a lot more, uh, not so much experimenting, but you need to do a lot of good interviewing and, and knowledge base of understanding the people that work for you or work with you, so you can you know kind of dangle the carrot so to speak and make them you know, want to be more effective. It also goes hand in hand with encouraging career growth, which I always say that a leader uh, a leader should be rated based on how many other leaders they make because their example and their training methods should create more leaders from their team like you should be a leader generator like you should be that person that's known for oh we put people on this person's team and those people become leaders those people become very industry known well um, industry related people these ones start leading teams start leading divisions start doing things uh, for us specifically it's a uh, it's really really a, a fun thing a cool thing to watch now the situation I'm going to toss you into here is that your own you're the only director in your company can uh, consisting of about 15 people again small company <laughs> startup type situation there's kind of a a, uh, a commonality with all these um, you oversee every employee as you report directly to the owner and president so there's only 15 people they all report to you and then you report to the owner slash president right the company is doing well and um, you know you're going to have to be hiring and growing rapidly very soon. The 15 people you have on staff are great, but none have actually shown any interest of taking on leadership roles within the organization. They're happy doing what they are doing. All right, this is for you disheartening because, you know, as a leader, you want to cultivate and create more leaders for the company and just in general. So my question to you is how would you try to encourage this group to excel in their career even though they don't really they're not really showcasing a demand to do that. Now, you know, give it some thought, think of some kind of practices or what you would do in this kind of situation because this is a loaded question and it's not always going to be like one answer fits all kind of situation here. But I can kind of guide you a little bit as far as how would you, you know, try to encourage this group to excel as a career. Um, just excel at their career is you kind of you know, really really discuss and bring up and kind of keep in front of their face all the different um, skill sets, assets, abilities, and show-offs that come from, uh, you know, excelling, becoming a leader, and actually, like, you know, catering to it. Uh, you know, everyone, I, don't, I can't guarantee that everyone wants progression, but for the most part, um, hungry, you know, employees and people that want to be successful, when they get into a position, they're looking for their, I guess, their transcendence, like where they're going to proceed to, to make more money, to get more responsibility, to move up with the organization on the hierarchical chain. And that's where you want to kind of encourage from. Um, another thing you could do is you can kind of guilt trip them a little bit. You could tell them that, you know, you don't want some outsider coming in and ruining things. Um, you want them to do it because you, you trust them, you respect them, and you think that they do a good job. And a lot of times those words of of encouragement can be enough to put it over but for the most part you're gonna have to get actively involved individually with these people to kind of figure out exactly what their motivation is for potentially taking on a, a you know, career growth role and doing more for a company or just doing more in general so you can promote them and you can get uh, you can feel confident in that uh, another one is I always like to talk about is, is change right so let's just jump into this so you start up you're, the startup you're working for had a bad quarter, and you have to let some staff go. All right, the company is only 60 employees, and you sadly have to let go of 20 people that have to be downsized. Um, the the company just simply does not have the capital nor the work to support these people, so you have to um, get rid of them. Luckily, uh, you don't actually have to give the news to these employees, but you're going to be around. So. But um, being let go, but as a manager, you'll need to get your employees through this tough time and this downsizing, meaning that you're going to have to, you know, any employee that's not getting that talk or getting that severance package and getting that mold, um, you need to have that discussion with as far as, uh, you know, keeping them on track, keeping them functioning, keeping them happy, and just saying, you know, this we'll get through this, it sucks, but we'll make it happen. And uh, that was always my kind of philosophy is empathizing and, um, you know, relating to them, and then trying to find a common ground or a commonality or a common decision based on that with their significant other or whoever they need to discuss with um, when it comes to that kind of situation. So, but for, uh, anyway, for you, as far as like how you're going to do this, um, the best practices is first, you can't make it sound 
positive. So whatever I, I the one thing I can tell you any leader or any person in general, when you have to give very bad news to a group of individuals, whether it's downsizing, layoffs, companies going under, no more bonuses, no more overtime, whatever that bad news is going to be, you need to you need to not be patronizing and make it sound like it's supposed to be a good thing because it's not. All right. Um, you know, in change management, you try to look at the bright side and you, you try to build the value and whatever the change is going to be because it's supposed to make the company better. This specific situation is not to make the company better. It's a necessity of the organization to keep operating. So there is nothing nice or good to be said about this type of circumstance besides that it was essential and it needed and it was the only way that the company would stay alive. Um, and usually people can relate or understand that situation because uh, you know they don't want the company to go under so they would prefer um, either to be short staffed or whatever in order to, for them to keep their jobs long term potentially. But as far as this certain circumstance you want to think of how you lead through change. I always, I've actually been in this situation and what we did is uh, you know, I didn't patronize anyone and say it was any of that crap. I didn't lie to them and say it was a you know direct business decision. There was no personal feelings or thoughts talked into everything, which I can't guarantee that because I don't. I didn't know how the process worked as far as selection. I wasn't a part of it, and we had a third party do it. And also, like they did it through our emailing uh, directory and just picked out names. They said I don't know who picked the names, why they picked the names, or how they did any type of commonality or rhyme or reason. But I can tell you this, when layoffs typically happen, because I've been on the other side of the other side of the fence with this, uh, there are direct choices made. It's not a randomness. They don't put it in a random generator and just pick out people because they oh that's stupid. They'll, they can lose some very key, very out uh, outperforming individuals uh, from this situation. So anyway, um, you be transparent, you be honest, and you just tell them it's going to be hard, but we're going to get through it. You know, you have a job to do, it's a day-to-day. -day. I'm, I'm sorry if, if this uh, situation has hurt anybody or put you all uneasy, but, uh, you know, just get through it and we'll get through it together. So you have, to sh you have to build that camaraderie, you have to build that essence, but I can't stress this enough. When this is a bad situation that you're trying to diffuse, give information to, or work through, um, you have to be genuine with it. You cannot fake care. You can't fake when you have to, when the people that you do have to lay off or that are told to lay off come to you, you cannot patronize them because it's going to be easy to say. Employees, subordinates, people that do work are not stupid and they can read human emotion and what's going on. All right, so lean through change, be cognitive of it. All right, so we ran through a bunch of scenarios. I talked a lot, so hopefully um, that helped out as far as like some of the different aspects of it. I want you to you know take your time and kind of think through some of these scenarios and these kind of situations and then um, you know work through that. The key factors um, for this week's assignments will kind of we've we've gone over those a bit but I'll try to trans I'll bring that over and talk about it right now. Alright so to revisit back to your week two module two based assignments you're gonna have a discussion based on uh, startups when you open it up it's going to give you you know a specific article on tesla make a decision to add to it robert thank you for already putting something in there <laughs> and then also um you're going to have assignments leading through startup where i give you a personalized situation from the company hot shop that i brought up earlier and you're going to give me exactly how you're going to kind of build through this scenario at hand and then, of course, you're going to have your week two reflection on the material that I have presented to you as far as the readings and any of the articles and everything that goes with that. All right. So uh, keep me keep me posted if you need anything. I hope you enjoyed um, the video lectures. I, again, I'm sorry and sad that I couldn't be there live to actually present this information to you um, virtually or or even virtually. But uh, watch these, uh, take them in account. If you have any direct questions or concerns about anything that comes up, please feel free to reach out to me. And I look forward to seeing you guys back when I return for Mod in Week 3. Thank you.